Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. America's had a long and contentious history with the word socialism. For conservatives, most often it is a dirty word, even unpatriotic. For many liberals, it's about social justice and compassion. However, for better or worse, it remains a red line within the electorate. Cross-talking socialism, I'm joined by my guest Caleb Maupin in New York. He is a journalist and political analyst at RT. In Miami, we have Soraya Foss. She is a former U.S. presidential candidate. And in Atlanta, we have LaDon Jones. She's an attorney and a former state director for Bernie Sanders in 2016. All right, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Uh, Caleb, let me, let me go to you first, because we've kind of bumped heads in the past about this issue here. What, what does socialism mean to you? And, and I really want to make it very clear here. I don't really want to go into the pros and cons of it. I want to talk about the meaning of it and in the context of American politics. Because uh, well, everyone knows I'm a conservative, but I, I'll have to you know, show my cards a little bit here. I'm really tired of conservatives throwing that word out as, it re as if it really means much anymore. Go ahead, Caleb, in New York. Well, the essence of socialism, in the sense that Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin and others wrote about, the essence of it is growth and progress. Uh, the idea is that the means of production, the banks, factories, major industries, should be organized to serve public good and liberated from the anarchy of production and the chaos of the market. And if we can get beyond profits and command, human growth and creativity can be unlimited and you know, wealth can expand for all of society. Uh, you know, in a rational society, in a socialist society, self-driving cars would be a great thing because uh, then there would be less work for everybody. But under capitalism, technological progress leads to poverty and instability. The more efficient it becomes to produce things, the fewer people you have to hire, the less people are getting paid in wages, and we lead to the disaster we're seeing in the West right now, which is a high-tech, low-wage economy, where working people who can only, only work so long as their work enriches a boss, uh, they, are, they are left outcast and starving as the means of production get more and more efficient. And socialism is about overcoming the irrationality of profits and command, having a centrally planned economy so that growth can be unlimited. Okay, so I, how, does, how do you define it? Because they, what, what we just heard from Caleb there is that everything is centralized essentially by the state, okay? Um, and historically in the 20th century, we've seen that is problematic at the very least. But I think that Caleb, I give him credit, that is basically the, 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 uh, the, the bones and flesh of what the idea is all about. Go ahead in Miami, your thoughts. It said it. Um, I think more than anything, the fear that everybody has is that socialism at the end will lead to communism, will lead to a classless, stateless, and an end to capitalism, uh, you know, within society. And that's the fear that everybody has when they hear it, the word socialism. Okay. But Caleb more or less, you know, summed it up as to what the textbook, you know, what the original definition of what should be. Okay, well, let's get a lid on here because I, now we're kind of kind of circling the wagons around really what's going on here because it, it, it's you know progress on one side, clearly that's the theory of it here, but the practice of it is about who has the power, and I think that that's that's really the debate here. Yeah, I mean, is it is it good to give the state all power or give it to oligarchs? I mean, if you're on, on the lower ring of society, does it really make any difference? Go ahead in Atlanta. So one very important component that was left out is that it is not socialism if it is not connect if it's not democratic, right? And so it's not just the government uh, making these decisions. It is people who are elected by the individuals who will be running the system that makes it socialism, right? It's about a means of production. So the people who will be educated in the system elect the officials who will decide how the system works, and then we can all equally use the system. So that's a very important component of socialism as it is today. It is involved and is a component of democracy. And so there are not oligarchs who can come in and make decisions unchecked. There's, they have to be elected and appointed by the people, just like they they can be removed by the people if they don't ensure that everyone has a bite at the apple for those important things like energy, transportation, health care, education, housing, all of those things that we all need right here all the time throughout uh, the entire world. 
Okay, well, Caleb, I mean, if, if it's that idyllic, and I, and I actually hear an echo of Bernie Sanders there, um, and, and I have to admit, LaDon, and it's turning into ancient history, but I've said repeatedly on this program, in 2016, there were only two candidates that I followed, and it was Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, okay? So, because his message does resonate, resonate with people and with a lot of conservatives, believe it or not, okay? Caleb, I mean, so, I mean, in the American context, because, I mean, I've lived around the world. I've lived most of my entire life, not my adult life, my entire life in different countries in the world. And all of them have had health care. All of them. Okay? Some of them better than others here. So why is it that America can't take best practices? Because that's the question I ask myself all of the time. Go ahead, Caleb. Well, part of the rise of neoliberal economics, Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan was pushing this notion that any involvement by the government in the economy is by definition socialism and leading to communism. Uh, and a lot of Americans believe that if they pay taxes, that that is socialism. Uh, a lot of Americans believe that uh, the post office is socialism. But all capitalist economies have state uh, actors and state government spending to some degree or other. I mean, you have to have paved roads, uh, you know, to facilitate people going and shopping at capitalist stores. And the notion that any state sector is somehow, somehow communism and we should get beyond it, that was introduced uh, into the United States during the 1970s. Really, we saw the rise of this kind of economic thinking, and it has led to big economic problems. Look at the United States, crumbling infrastructure. I mean, the Rust Belt, uh, you know, economic decay. Uh, you know, we got a system of prisons for profit, military contractors. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing neoliberal free market extremism brought to its logical conclusion in the United States. Um, and I think, that, I think that it's those ideas that say that any involvement by the government, any social welfare state is you know, you should immediately think of Joseph Stalin. Uh, that kind of thinking has led to big problems in the United States, but that's why the term is now being used so loosely, is that, you know, we've been programmed through the Cold War to just, you know, have this gut hostile reaction to anything associated with communism. So now it's useful, uh, you know, as we're facing an economic problem to point at those who would want to resolve it or in implement measures that are designed to address it and say, aha, you're a communist. Uh, yeah. it, it's Politics. No, but, but Caleb, you're absolutely right. I mean, conservatives and progressives, you know, I, w there's a lot to discuss among ourselves, a lot, and a lot of progress can be made. But then we have the, the neoliberals, we have the, the establishment here, they throw in the hand grenade. It's called socialism, and then they make everyone argue about it, okay? That's, I get sick and tired of that, because conservatives and progressives have a lot in common if we give each other a chance instead of letting these neoliberals mediate the conversation all the time. So I, the thing that really, in Miami, one of the things that really bothers me about this socialism debate, there's plenty of socialism in the American economy, and that's the coddling of big business by the government. You know, when there's a crisis, who gets bailed out first? Big, big, big companies, okay? I really resent that. I resent that a lot, okay? And we saw that in 2008, and then we saw it last year and through this year with the pandemic, okay? If you're rich and powerful, you're going to get concierge service. That's socialism in my mind, and I don't like that kind of socialism. Go ahead in Miami. I think that's one of the big issues that we're having and that we're seeing today is that uh, these bigger corporations are the ones that are getting the bailouts and the people who really need it, the middle class and the lower class, you know, they're the ones that are having a more difficult time because we don't see it even when it comes with the stimulus, you know, all these billions of dollars are going to help uh, all the corporations and it's not really coming to the people. If we were to really divide it, the wealth, you know, of what it is they want to help the economy, they would go directly to to the people from the start. Well, you know, but yeah, yeah, but I mean, go, good. Let's go back to Ladon because about what about the democratic process here? It seems to me, you know, when you, when I look at polling and I looked at a lot of Gallup polling right before the presidential election, is that there's a huge myth out there. A lot of people want assist; they want to have uh, some kind of um, like uh, pre-K paid for. I'm for it, okay? Community college free. I'm for it, okay? Absolutely for it, okay? You have to give people a stake in society. But then, you know, then it's you know. A bill was passed and it's all doled out to these this education industrial complex and then they suck up all the money and they teach their kids trash that's my opinion go ahead ladon 
you've hit the nail on the head. So here's a key component to make socialism work. It's not just about doling out money from the government to people who need it, wherever you fall on the spectrum. It is also about the people doing the work. So when we have infrastructure projects in the United States, a lot of times those are job producing, right? So you have elected officials who are taking sums of money to invest in a role that we all use, but then they also are investing in the employment of people who then get to receive those funds on the back end because we know labor tends to be one of the highest cost of any project that you have. And so when you have something that's like the, the stimulus, right, where these big corporations got millions of dollars, but we have no control, no authority, no input for how those millions and billions are used, right? And the people who run the corporations get to decide how that money is doled out. There's no guarantee that it's going to trickle down to the people who are actually working, right? There's no benefit to the overall United States economy. There's no benefit to the fact that, you know, this restaurant isn't feeding people who need to eat. It's feeding people who are willing to pay the money to eat, right? So that that funnels into capitalism. So a very important component of socialism that people forget is not just free education. It's also the employment of teachers and pre-K teachers and all of the people who feed into our system from bus drivers to the cafeteria workers. The same thing with any other level of socialism. And so when folks think of that antiquated term, when they're thinking about what happened during the Cold War, we have to remember, particularly in American politics, Republicans were once Dixiecrats, right? They were Democrats at one time, and we did a switch. Well, there is another switch that took place, right, with socialism, particularly democratic socialism, as Bernie Sanders and others in AOC speak of it. And we have to look at it in that format. If we're still trying to use the terminology from the 1800s and the early 1900s, we're going to miss the point and the benefits of what socialism really is. Well, I, you know, dear, I hope we can all agree, all four of us can agree that trickle-down economics, you know, we need to retire the term and the the, and the, the, the actions, okay, because it certainly has not worked. And, and we can, that's a topic of a totally different program here. I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on socialism. Stay with our team. Okay, let's go back to Caleb in, in New York. I mean, you know, this whole discussion about the infrastructure uh, bill that the administration is proposing and trying to get Republican support here. I, again, I think that um, the term socialism warps everything. I think the neoliberal media warps everything because they're looking to score points. It, again, it has nothing to do with people. It has to do with, you know, their shareholders and their political affiliations and allegiances here. I mean, if you look at this infrastructure bill, I don't have a problem with the price tag. It's over 10 years. My goodness, you know, they'll never touch this defense spending, will they? But, you know, this infrastructure thing, and I, if it's done right, it creates jobs, and it pays for itself eventually if it's done right. There's one thing I don't, I really worry about, Caleb, and, and maybe I'll kick up a little bit of dust on the program with this one. I don't like the strings attached, you know. Do you have to have critical race theory? Do you have to have these wokest elements, you know, to be able to get the money? You know, there's a lot of people that are very uneasy about that, and it feels very totalitarian. And particularly if it is a demand and not a negotiation, an explanation here. How do you, how would you, you know, alleviate worries uh, of half the country uh, when it comes to that issue? Go ahead, Caleb. Well, I share a lot of your concerns, Peter. Look, I started out by saying the essence of socialism is growth. Um, but if you listen to a lot of the rhetoric coming out of the White House right now, it seems like Sleepy Joe doesn't believe in growth. He thinks growth is bad. Smaller is better. Build a bigger empire. I mean, this is Rockefeller, Malthusian idea, right? This is, this is very dangerous. And all throughout the United States, uh, we have seen the rise of pessimism. In a lot of ways, you know, Joe Biden seems like Jimmy Carter 2.0. Uh, pushing this notion that we need to reduce consumption. You know, while Republicans are pushing for full deregulation, libertarian free market policies, uh, it seems like a lot of what the Democrats want is not growth and rational planning of the economy, 
but rather what they want uh, is simply a state managed austerity. You know, gradually, gradually roll back the living standards, oversee a continuing process where the next generation has a much lower standard of living than their parents ever had. You know, try to control them, whether it's with, you know, managed social media or whether it's, it's with drugs, if they haven't already gotten on Ritalin when they're kids, you know, give them marijuana and give them hallucinogens as adults. And, and you know, there is a very dangerous kind of managerial, uh, you know, social, social engineering aspects to what the liberals are doing right now. And small businesses seem to be the most, you know, targeted by it. They seem very, very, you know, upset and, and you know, they may be wiped out. It may be the big capitalists like Amazon and Walmart who really benefit from, from what they're proposing. Um, but it's interesting because if you look around the world, the strength of socialism in the 21st century, whether you go to Vietnam or Nicaragua or, or China, has been, you know, while you have a state central plan, empowering small businesses, micro entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know, you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics is all about having a market sector in order to combine the strengths of capitalism with the overall vision of, of socialism and planning. Caleb, you know, you know, you know, you're, you're talking about you know lowered expectations and downsizing. Do you know what? In you know what, one sector is really exploding: super yachts. That's exploding right now. They're building the biggest yachts of all time. Okay, they're not downsizing here. Sorry that you know Caleb brings up such an excellent point, and as I'd like to say again. Conservatives and progressives can have a lot in common. A lot of what Caleb said, I absolutely agree with here. But what about entrepreneurs? I mean, it's one of the things going through the lockdowns and the reaction to the pandemic. There seems to be no interest in helping middle-sized small businesses. I mean, absolutely none. I mean, horrific stories of, uh, for no reason of all, people are just shut down, and then their competitors that are, you know, these big box companies, you know, you can go shopping there, but you can't go to a mom-and-pop farm I mean, where is that in the in, in the economy moving forward here? Because I would have thought that that would be pro people, very you know, uh, part of the socialist dream, but it's not there. It's almost completely void. Go ahead in Miami. Yeah, that's very dangerous because we've had at least I can speak here locally. A lot of businesses were closed because of that. They didn't really have so much of the support as much as um, I would say it came in later on in the game. By then, they couldn't maintain their businesses. Um, just to touch on a little bit of what Caleb was saying regarding the infrastructure, a lot of the issues that we're having, I mean, it's great and it's very ideal, but you're going to see that those companies that are going to get the contracts, it's not going to be the people that are working. It's always somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody who is a third cousin or son-in-law or whatever that ends up with these types of contracts and the money just stays in the same circle. And that's where we're seeing that there's a huge problem. I mean, whether it's at a local or a national, it's always, um, they always seem to have a way to still keep the profit out of it. It's never really about the people. And that's where my concern is really at right now. Yeah, well, you know, we, we there, there's, it's called um, influence peddling and pay to play. And um, there's plenty of it to go around. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now, but I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. Let's go back to I Atlanta here. You know, one of the things, uh, I, a lot of the figures that you'll see in the bottom of your screen when you watch this here, is from a Gallup poll before the election. And I was really kind of struck how many young people are attracted to the idea of socialism. And, when, and reading the, the fine print, Ladon, what I found really interesting is that it may not be particularly an attraction to a certain idea of socialism, but a rejection of neoliberalism because, you know what, it's not working for them, okay? And, and you, you don't have to explain it theoretically. You, they're living it, okay? Go ahead, Linda. So your, your other guests hit the nails on the head, right? So the reason why government involvement is a crucial component of socialism is to make sure that your cousin doesn't get the big contract behind the doors, right? That's where the government control and regulations come in on the other end of this uh, free market that the conservatives like to push forward so that, you know, free capitalism and free growth. See, the difference is there was a time that Republicans were uh, conservative as it was to spending, right? We have to protect our financial future for future generations. Now, this generation, which was the future generation that they were speaking of and saying, we're good with the money. What we are concerned about is the air. We're concerned about being able to breathe. We're concerned about 
pandemics, right? And these things that spread across the globe and we have a responsibility to ensure that for the future. And we are willing to give up some of our freedoms, right? We are willing for these really rich folks who are building these yachts to have to build more uh, efficient yachts um, that are better for our earth and for the atmosphere to, in order to preserve the future long term, because you are right. They are not the beneficiaries of all of this um, high-end capitalism, this unfettered uh, access to capital that, that um, the capitalists have pushed forward. And so what is important with socialism is, one, making sure that there are limits on people who are able to just outspend and outdo. I am a both a loser and a recipient of what has gone on since the pandemic. I owned one business that closed in the beginning of the pandemic because we were very reliant on people coming in. And if they couldn't come in, we couldn't proceed. But then my other businesses have have benefited through the payroll and the PPP and other things that have come in that have allowed me to grow and hire more people. So there is a benefit and a burden that has come in that all tie in with socialism. And the underlying goal is that particularly in America, we are far too rich of a country to have as many homeless, to have as many unemployed, to have as many people who are struggling out there that if we just took a little bit of time and the organization of the government to ensure that everyone has a fair shot at being able to have health care, we will all be better off. Yeah, Caleb, you know, that's one of, you know, with all my conservative friends really get upset with me when I talk about health care because um, I've seen a good part of the world, and it's not a debate in most of the world. It's, it's pretty obvious what's right, okay, and what works here, okay? And, you know, and it's something that, you know, maybe I can tell our viewers here, you know, you know, being an American, being brought up in America, the anxiety of not having health care really is an amazing, amazing negative effect on you. You're afraid of getting sick, okay? In most of the world, at least in the developed world here, nobody's afraid of getting sick. I mean, it happens, unfortunately, and there is assistance there because you pay your taxes here. But the impact it has on Americans is a truly extraordinary. And this pandemic tells us everything that's wrong with the, uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry. It's really uh, the heights of Im uh, Im immorality of what we're seeing with these vaccines and IP and all of that. When the, you know, they're protecting their, their patents. No, the American people paid for those patents. They paid for the research. They paid for all of the research. They've been doing it for one patent after another for well over a decade. And you have the mainstream media parroting you know, oh, you know, it's, you know, somebody might be able to use the formulas and cure cancer. God forbid something like that happens. I mean, do they, uh, do they have any understanding of what they're saying? Because it, it really shows the lack of any kind of uh, a moral compass of what the average condition of the average American is and what the world is uh, experiencing because of this pandemic. Go ahead, Caleb. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, this notion that conservatism and capitalism walk hand in hand. They is don't. Pretty they don't. Uniquely American, and it's pretty, pretty Western. Um, and, you know, if you look at it, you know, conservative anti-capitalism predates Marxism by hundreds of years. You know, the Catholic Church was looking during the rise of capitalism and saying this is a system where money is being put over religious principles. It's, in, it's encouraging, you know, breaking apart of, of the bonds that hold society together. And there is a strong conservative critique of capitalism. Um, in the United States, we seem to have, have lost that. There's yes. this notion that yes. people even in markets you must be on the left. And I, I don't think that's true internationally speaking. I mean, if you look at the political spectrum, right-wing anti-capitalism has been around for a long time. Um, but I think that the essence of the problem we have in the United States is, look, if the pie is only so big, the only way your slice can get bigger is by cutting into somebody else's. And nobody ever thinks that their slice of the pie is too big. In fact, they want their slice of the pie to get bigger. And so when you, when you say that there is a limit to growth, when you declare that growth is bad, you're setting up for huge divisions in society. You're setting up for all kinds of problems. But if we can get back to the notion that 
growth is unlimited and that if we can get beyond the irrationality of greed and profits running our economy and we can mobilize to build like Roosevelt did during the Great Depression, you know, with the, the Works Progress Administration, you know, appealing to, you know, people's desire to go out and build a better world, friendship with countries around the world that are that are trying to do the same thing and lift themselves up out of poverty. Um, you know, we could we could get beyond, you know, the, the divisions that are inherent in the notion that the pie is only so big. And and I think that that is the biggest impediment we have here in the United well, States. Well, you know, Caleb, I think it's neoliberalism de de determines the size of the cake and they're the ones that decide who cuts it. And that's the problem here. That's all the time we have. I want to thank my guests in New York, Miami and in Atlanta. And I want to thank our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. Thank you.